I'm here to tell you about selecting features in a high dimension. So why do I care about this problem? So Sylvain said that I was working at uh, MinParisTech, which is an engineering school, and Institut Curie, which is a cancer research institute. So I work with genomics data. And uh, in genomics data, I often have this type of data set that I've represented here, where I have a study on a number of people. So here is the people are either blue or orange. Uh, in my studies, they either have developed a certain type of cancer or not, or they a treatment worked on them or did not, uh, or it can also be a continuous uh, outcome that I'm interested in. And I have for all those people a uh, genotype, which is, uh, can be um, obtained in very different ways. Uh, but the one I've presented here is I know for a number of positions uh, along the genome, whether this position is mutated or not. So just at a single letter of the DNA, uh, whether it's mutated or not in those people. Um, and so, the data I have, it's typically about 1,000 people. Like, usually 1,000 control, 1,000 cases, you're really happy. Uh, and those uh, features I've described, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of them, if not millions. And what I'm interested in, what the people I'm working with, the geneticists I'm working with, are interested in, is figuring out, among all those features, which are the ones that explain the phenotypes, so which is the thing I'm observing on the people, so here, whether they're orange or blue. Uh, so this is a feature selection problem um, with millions of features and only thousands of samples. OK, so this is definitely not big data. Uh, it's not big data because actually the data fits on the RAM of my laptop. It's also not big data because instead of having, if, you represent, if I represent my data in such a matrix with uh, the rows are samples and the columns are features. That of, instead of having a big matrix, um, I have what something, sometimes people call a fat matrix, where I have many more columns than rows. And this is a huge statistical nightmare. Um, so you may have learned about this, know that uh, we don't like it when we have more features and samples, like we don't have a unique solution for linear regression, uh, we're more likely to overfit. Uh, but to illustrate the problem, I've made some simulations. Uh, all right, so I've been using Python and I've simulated some data, so with 150 samples, 1,000 features, so it's actually data that's better behaved than the one I'm working with. And among those 1,000 features, I've picked 10 to be causal. So by causal, I mean that uh, I've generated my output, Y, to be a linear combination of 10 of those features with random weights, W, and then there's some noise. So here is a representation of uh, this, uh, data, this feature weights. So on the x-axis, I have my 1,000 features, and uh, the dots are the weights that are assigned to them in this linear model. Uh, and so you see orange dots are the 10 uh, causal features and the other features have blue dots at zero. Okay, so now if I only have the data, X and Y, I want to recover which ones, position, which are the positions that have the orange dots instead of the blue dots. Uh, okay, so I work with biologists, so they tell me, do a t-test. Okay, so I can do that in Python. Uh, for each of the features, I look at I do a statistical test to know whether this feature is associated or not with my outcome. And here's what I get. So on this plot, I still have my features on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, I have minus log 10 of the p-value of my test, so the higher uh, means a small p-value, and there's a line that's drawn at the threshold for statistical significance, and you see there's one feature that is, uh, that's been picked out. And even if I was lowering this white line, that's my significant threshold, uh, you see that everything that's below it is kind of all mixed up, and I would not recover uh, my features, which are, like, have the orange uh, p-values. OK. Uh, so obviously here, I've been looking at my features independently from each other, and I've simulated the data using a linear model, so maybe I should be doing a linear regression. Uh, all right, so um, I can do that with scikit-learn, uh, linear regressions, and I look at uh, the uh, weights uh, of the features in my model, 
And here's what I get. So you see I'm slightly better. I've picked up a second feature, but still, uh, there's a lot. I mean, there's not really any way to distinguish eight of my orange features from the other blue ones. And if I'm trying to predict with this model, so I've separated my data in a train set and test set before doing this, uh, so I can use this uh, linear regression I've just learned uh, on my test set. And you see that the prediction, the prediction is really bad. Uh, so I have an RMSE of 0.21, and it doesn't look very correlated. So here I have the true value on the, y ac on the x axis and the predicted value on the y axis. Um, all right. So one solution to this type of problem is called regularization. What is regularization? It's this idea that when you're fitting a linear model, or all sorts of other models, but in particular a linear regression, you're minimizing the loss. So the loss is the error uh, that your model is making. Uh, and you don't impose any constraint on your weights. Your weights, they can be anywhere in the space of weight values. So if you have p features, you have p plus one weights in your linear regression if you have a bias, and your features, your weights, sorry, they can be anywhere in r to the p plus one. Now what you can do is add a constraint to the thing you're minimizing. It's called a regularizer, and what it's going to do is going to reduce the space where your weights can live and say, no, it's living here, in that region only. So one example of this that's quite well known is to use the L1 norm uh, of the weight vector as a, as a regularizer. So it's the sum of the absolute values of the weights. Uh, and if I do this, uh, so now instead of being able to, instead of being allowed to be anywhere in space, the weights, they are constrained to be in this cube that I've drawn here in 2D. And this is called the lasso. And what the lasso does, it's, it imposes sparsity on the weights. It's going to put a lot of my regression coefficients to zero. So whereas before in my linear regression, if you recall the plot, the blue dots, they were everywhere and they were not there was like no coefficient that was exactly zero. So now I'm going to use this method on my data. It's, it's a standard method. It's implemented in scikit-learn. And here's what I get. So you see it's much better. I've picked a few features that have non-zero weights and they shouldn't. There's two features here that uh, were causal and haven't been picked up. But all in all, I'm, I've been doing a bit better. I have high weights on uh, important features. All right, if I'm doing a prediction, it's slightly better than the method I had before. So uh, with a linear regression, the vanilla linear regression, I had a root mean squared error of 0.21, and here I have a root mean squared error of 0.19. It's still not that great. OK, so here's uh, where the exciting things are starting to happen. Uh, so when I've been using the sparsity constraint, I've used a form of prior knowledge about my problem, which is that not all the mutations were involved in explaining what I was interested in explaining. Um, and that's not the only thing I know about those mutations. And in particular, in biology, uh, we have a lot of knowledge that's organized as networks. So you know that genes are working with other genes, and you can represent this as a graph or a network. Uh, this is not the only field where you can do this, so if you think uh, of an image, you could say that pixels that are near each other, they're more likely to work together towards representing what's on the, on the picture uh, than uh, pixels that are far apart, or if you have a uh, region of the brain, um, say some of them are connected via synapses, um, and you can represent this as a network. So now I want to use this network to help me do my feature selection problem. So I want that my regression weights that follow the structure. So what this means is that I want that features that are uh, near each other on this network, that are connected on this network, I want them to have weights that are quite similar. And I can do this by adding another term to uh, my objective function. So this is the lasso I was showing before. And now I can add another constraint, so this connectivity constraint. So I'm not going to go into the mathematical details, uh, but what I'm using here is uh, Laplace in L. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that's very easy to compute from the adjacency matrix of the graph, so the matrix that tells you 
it's a matrix of zeros and ones, uh, and uh, it has um, the dimension p by p, where p is your number of features, number of nodes in your graph, and each entry tells you if it's a zero, there's no connection between those two features, and if it's a one, the two features are connected. Um, and this constraint, this connectivity constraint, is going, going to impose exactly what I want. So this is something that's called the network uh, constraint lasso, and um, it's not a very uh, super classical machine learning algorithm, so it's not implemented in scikit-learn. Uh, but it's actually not so difficult to implement yourself because you can just write a little transformation of your data based on this Laplacian, and then uh, it's going to be equivalent to a lasso uh, on this new data. Uh, and if you do this, now this is what you get. Look, I've picked up my 10 features. So this is like an 11 feature that has a small weight, like towards uh, the 750 mark, uh, but it's doing much better. And this lasso model I've trained, now I can look at its uh, uh, predictive power on my test set, and now I have an RMSC that dropped from 0.19 to 0.14, and the data looks, the prediction looks more correlated to the true value. All right. Um, so doing all this, I was focusing on minimizing a loss, so I was focusing on the prediction. But what I'm really interested in here is the feature selection problem. So Instead of uh, minimizing a loss, I would like to focus on maximizing the relevance of the features I'm selecting. So here, uh, V is a set of all features, and S is a subset of features I'm looking for. Uh, and I have a relevance function. I have a function that's scoring for each feature how important it is uh, towards explaining my outcome. Um, so, the reason why I'm inter interested in this type of formulation is that uh, there's lots of statistical tests that have been developed for all sorts of things, and in particular for the type of problems I work with, and lots of biostatisticians that have thought about how to model the data uh, and develop statistical tests that are a bit more inter interesting than the t-tests I did at the beginning. Um, okay, so now I want that the features I'm selecting they form connected subnetworks on, my, uh, on the network I had. Um, OK, so instead of having this problem where I'm minimizing a loss plus some constraints, I'm maximizing this relevance function uh, minus some constraints. And you see there's a symmetry. So from the sparsity constraint, I can translate it into a sparsity constraint on my set of selected features. So it's just the size of the set. Uh, and for the connectivity, I can translate it in something that's uh, very similar, actually. It doesn't uh, look like it on this, on this slide, but what it's saying, is, what it's doing is connectivity constraint, that it's looking at all the pairs of connected nodes, and it's adding one to the constraint term uh, if, for this perf, it's for this edge, one of the features is selected and the other isn't. So if you have a lot of disconnections, like your features are just spread out anywhere in the network, you're going to have a lot of edges with one node that's, con that's selected and the other that aren't, that isn't, sorry. Um, and so this connectivity term is going to be large. On the contrary, if you have modules, uh, so subnetworks of connected features uh, that are selected, uh, you're not going to have that many disconnections and this term is going to be smaller. Um, so this thing something we call uh, selecting features as nodes. So Sfan is the name of the package, well, of the GitHub project, more than package, it's not a package yet. Um, and there's one advantage to this formulation is that it uh, allows for an efficient uh, implementation using graph stuff, so min cut and max flows, uh, which is interesting because remember, uh, I'm working on graphs that have millions of features. Um, and so this is a paper in which we published it. And uh, so uh, it's a bit harder to implement than just a few lines in scikit-learn, uh, but we wrote some code to do this. Um, and here is the result of what we're doing. So remember now, I'm only, I don't assign a weight to my feature. A feature is either selected or not selected. Uh, so which is why I only have zero or one, and I picked up exactly the features uh, that I was interested in. Uh, okay, so then I can train a linear regression using uh, only the features that I have selected. And here is uh, what it gives on my test set. So it, um, the RMSC dropped again from 0.14 to 0.10. Uh, 
uh, and my predictions now look quite correlated to the, uh, to the true outcome. All right, so I hope I've convinced you that when you have more features than samples, you're going to have problems, but we have solutions. Uh, so the first solution is to use constraints. Uh, so you can start by adding using a sparsity constraint, and that's like, been well known for quite some time now. It's a lasso. But you can also add some structural constraints so, and tell your features, look, I know how you work. I want the selected features to respect the structure I'm imposing. So I've showed you examples with a graph, but there exist versions with trees, so if you have a hierarchy on your features, and also with groups, so if you know that you have groups of features, so that is a natural way of grouping your features, and that probably only a features from your few groups should be involved in explaining your outcome, you can use that as well. Um, and also, if your main goal is to do feature selection, uh, then maybe you should focus on the feature selection problem, and that's what we've done with this uh, regularized relevance framework, so the uh, selecting, selecting features as nodes fan framework I've presented before. All right. So, uh, if you want more information, this is the URL of my, of my website. Uh, you will also find from there my GitHub, uh, the code for Sven, the notebook with all the code that I've presented to you today. And uh, I'd like to finish by thanking first Scikit-Learn and Matplotlib, without whom I wouldn't have been able to do those slides, and uh, Dominic Grimm, Yoshinobu Kawahara, and Karsten Borgvat, uh, with whom I've been working uh, a lot on this project. And I'd like to thank you for your attention.